Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's video. So today I wanted to talk about um, a probability problem that I saw, that I learned about yesterday, and also how to solve it. Um, and in order to solve it, you, in order to solve it straightforward and easily, um, you make use of a very important theorem in statistics known as Bayes' theorem. And so this was a theorem uh, that was discovered by a man named Thomas Bayes. Okay. And so that will be the major discussion of the day, Bayes' theorem and how we can use it to solve this very interesting probability problem. Uh, so first, let me introduce the problem. And I want to thank again, Miss Lee for showing me this problem. And it goes like so. On the morning of June 1st, a hospital nursery has three boys and some number of girls. So already some cryptic information, some number of girls, we're not too sure. That night, a woman gives birth to a child and the child is placed in the nursery. Okay, so now some more information. There's a woman that gives birth on the night of June 1st. On June 2nd, a statistician conducts a survey and selects a child at random from the nursery. And so the group of children that he's selecting from, or she is selecting from, um, includes the newborn from the night of June 1st. The child selected is a boy. So that piece of information is important. Um, what is the probability that the child born on June 1st was a boy? Okay, so that's the question we're trying to answer. What is the probability that the child born on June 1st was a boy? Now, initially you might think to yourself, well, a woman gives birth, um, there's a 50-50 chance it's a boy, there's a 50-50 chance it's a girl. So problem solved, simple. Not so fast because we were given some information. That sentence before that tells us the child is a boy now kind of changes things. It's not as straightforward as woman gives birth 50% chance boy, 50% chance girl. It's not that simple anymore because that, that situation was, um, I guess, injected with new information. And that is that the child is a boy. And so now in order to solve this problem, we need to um, understand a little bit about conditional probabilities. And so before we solve the problem, let's do a little bit of discussion, let's have a little discussion about conditional probabilities. Now I am assuming some basic knowledge of conditional probabilities um, and their relationship between joint and marginal probabilities. And if you're a student of mine in my stats class, I definitely hammered this home many, 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 many times. <clears throat> so if, you're, if you don't remember, here's what we call just follow the highlighter as I speak. Here's what we call a conditional probability. Um, that probability is read as the probability of event A happening given that event, uh, event B has happened or will happen, right? These events aren't necessarily happening at the same time. Um, shorthand, though, we usually just read that as the probability of A given B, all right? That's called a conditional probability. Now, this equivalence that we see here is extremely important and is going to be the backbone of what we know as Bayes' theorem. Um, so that numerator here, we would read as the probability of A and B. This is known as a joint probability or an intersectional probability. The, denominator is just simply read as the probability of B. Um, and this is known as a marginal probability. 
So marginal probabilities deal with one event at a time, whereas of course joint or intersectional probabilities deal with um, <clears throat> when the two events are occurring simultaneously. And the conditional probability deals with, all right, we're, we know some information about event B, what's the probability then that event A occurs? Okay, and this relationship holds true and again is one of the fundamental relationships in probability. Okay, so let's understand this relationship uh, since it is so important. Um, so, the probability that A happens given that B happens. So if you look at this Venn diagram, um, we have two variables at play. Uh, variable one, and let's just say that variable one can take on two values, A and A complement. Now, A complement is not visible in this diagram, but let's just say that A complement means everything outside of the, outside of A's circle. So, if this orange highlighter represents event A, then everything outside of it in this green highlighter represents a complement. And notice I, I erased that event B because um, I really just want you to focus on understanding that we have event A and then everything that is not inside of event A is what's called a complement. All right, so let me get rid of that. All right, similarly, we have B and B complement. Okay, I'm not gonna go ahead and, and show you where B complement is, but it's the same idea. Um, it's B complement is everything outside of the B circle. Okay, and let's go into calculating this conditional probability um, based off of this Venn diagram. Now, uh, I filled in a whole bunch of color. A lot of color just jumped onto the screen. Um, so I want you to understand that in general, um, when we are given some kind of information, like that event B is true, which is what we're given here, then that restricts the total population of possible events that we are, that we are studying. Whereas initially, we might have looked at this entire rectangle as all the possible outcomes. Um, now, with this given information, we're only interested in the orange circle of possible outcomes because we were told that we exist within that space. And that's why the denominator only uh, is only taking, taking into account the probability that B is true, okay? It's restricting the population down to that circle. In the numerator here, we're looking for where within that circle does event A occur? And where within that circle does event A occur? Well, that can be denoted as exactly the intersection of A and B. So this little green part here in the Venn diagram that you're seeing. And so that little intersection is the numerator and the entire orange circle, including that intersection, is the denominator. And that's how you would calculate this conditional probability. Okay? So that's just a little, hopefully, understanding of that relationship. Okay, so I know there's a lot going on down here, but don't be too worried. So once again, the probability of A given B, as we just saw, it makes sense that we can say that that is equal to the probability of A and B over the probability of B. Now, oftentimes, when you're given a problem like this, A given B, there's a lot of information that is unknown. You obviously, if you're asked to solve the probability of A given B, then you obviously don't know that explicitly. Um, and oftentimes you, you don't know the value of the intersection probability and you don't know the value of the marginal probability. So if you have an equation and there are three unknown pieces, 
uh, that seems like it's going to be very difficult to solve. And it is up until Thomas Bay came up and uh, discovered Bayes' theorem. So I want you to see something. Um, so we're gonna work towards rewriting this numerator and this denominator into something that is equivalent. Okay, so I want you to see something here though. Um, just like probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B over the probability of B, well, you can similarly say that the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B and A over the probability of A. It's the same exact relationship. I just switched the order of the conditions. In, in other words, I reversed the conditions. Okay. Um, but, but the concept is exactly the same. Now, here I'm performing an algebraic operation. I'm simply um, multiplying both sides of this equation by the probability of A. So I can rewrite this as this equation equivalently as the probability of B and A is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A. All right, so hopefully you see that that's just simply a, um, an algebraic operation. And one thing I did also want to point out, which is going to be useful for us, is that the probability of B and A is exactly the same as saying the probability of A and B. Right, wherever B and A intersect, intersect is the same as where A and B intersect. All right, so that being said, hopefully you can see now that I, I've shown you that you can rewrite this numerator as instead of the probability of A and B, you can write it as the probability of B given A times the probability of A. Okay, so that's the numerator. So what I've effectively done, again, notice, is I've reversed the conditions. And this is what Bayes' theorem does so well. Um, because sometimes, if you don't necessarily know the information when B is true, you might know some of these probabilities given that A is true, as you'll see in that challenge problem. Okay, so we have the fact that these two guys are equal, right? So that's where my numerator comes from. Now let's work on rewriting that marginal probability in the denominator in a different way. So I want you to notice that <clears throat> this entire circle of B can be written as two joint probabilities. All right, so the green section here is exactly the intersection of B and A. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the blue section here in the Venn diagram is exactly the intersection of B and A complement, right? Remember, A complement was everything that is outside of that A circle. And so if I want the probability of B occurring, I can write it as a sum of these two parts, the probability of B and A plus the probability of B and A complement. So now I have my marginal written as two joint probabilities. And you might remember that we just saw a way to rewrite a joint probability as a product of a conditional and a marginal. So, what I am going to do now, let's zoom out so we get the entire picture. This probability of B and A, so some of my highlighters are gonna overlap, but that's all right. This probability of B and A that we see here, well, we also see it right here. 
And of course, I can rewrite it as the probability of B given A times the probability of A. And so that's what I've done right here. Okay, so I'm just using that idea from above to rewrite this first joint probability. Um, and in a similar way, I am rewriting the probability of B and A complement. I want to erase this because all right, I'm writing this probability of B and A complement as the probability of B given A complement times the probability of A complement. Now, I didn't go through and exactly derive that um, explicitly, but you can, you can see through this string of logic how it could be true. I mean, it's the same exact calculation, just with different, um, different values of the variables, okay? So, long story short, I just rewrote my marginal probability as probability of B given A times the probability of A plus the probability of B given A complement, extend that, times the probability of A complement. Right, and there we have it. It may not at this moment look spectacular. Let me just have some highlighter in this denominator just to make things look nice and colorful, even though at this point, it doesn't really play a purpose. Um, although it kind of does, because we do have the marginal probability highlighted here in orange. So, it may not look spectacular, but this is Bayes' theorem. So let me go ahead and write this where it's all on its own, as it should be, because it's very important. So Bayes' theorem, probability of A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A all over the probability of B given A times the probability of A. By the way, you might recognize that as being exactly the same as the numerator, plus the probability of B given A complement times the probability of A complement. So uh, this is Bayes' theorem. This is actually a limited version of Bayes' theorem where each variable only has two possible outcomes. Uh, this can be generalized uh, even further, and I will leave that to the viewer to sort of think about that on their own. But this is the version of Bayes' theorem that we're going to use to solve Miss Lee's problem that she presented to me. So there it is in all its glory. It may seem unspectacular, but it is actually so powerful. Um, and again, what it is useful for doing is something called the reverse conditioning. Notice that the initial problem had B as the condition, but every single piece in Bayes' theorem on the right side has A as the condition. All right, now let's go into back into the problem information. Initially, we were told that there are three boys and N girls in the nursery. This is before the birth on the night of June 1st. Now, there are two events that occur. There's the June 1st birth, and there are two possible outcomes, B, boy or girl. Um, I label them as B sub 1, comma, G sub one. Those are the possible outcomes for the variable of the June 1st birth. And then there's the June 2nd selection. And I label those as B sub two and G sub two, those possible outcomes. Um, the subscripts just kind of give us an indication of what date the, select, uh, the event occurred on. Now, 
The question that we're trying to answer is not simply what is the probability of B1? So what is the probability that, that the June 1st birth was a boy? We're not trying to ans answer that question. Um, based on what we discussed, hopefully it makes sense that we're actually trying to answer what is the probability that the June 1st birth was a boy given that the June 2nd selection was a boy, right? Because we are told that the child is a boy and that is referring to um, a st statistician selects a child at random. So that child selected was a boy. That's the given information right here. That's our condition. On the condition that the June 2nd baby selected was a boy, what is the probability that the June 1st birth was a boy? All right, well, let's get into it. Now, of course, <clears throat> we can just use the very basic relationship between conditionals, joints, and marginals. But we're not, we're going to get nowhere fast here because looking at this table, which of course it's not exactly the same as a Venn diagram, but a lot of the same information can be gathered. So that numerator probability of B1 and B2, we can visualize that intersection in the table because if we look at the B1 column, and the B2 column, I'm sorry, the B2 row, I should say, where those two guys intersect, that is exactly the joint probability. So that's how a joint probability shows up in one of these tables. This is called a contingency table, by the way. Um, notice that that cell is currently blank because I don't know the probability of B1 and B2. So unfortunately, I can't fill out that numerator. I also can't fill out the denominator because, well, let's play it out. The probability that the boy selected on June 2nd was a boy. Um, the thing is, I need to know how many boys are there are on June 2nd. So here, let's say the day passes and now we're in June 2nd. Um, we don't know exactly how many boys or how many girls we have. And so I really can't answer the question, what's the probability that the, the general probability that the selection um, on June 2nd was a boy. If I knew how many boys and how many girls I had, then I could make that, uh, I could come to a conclusion, but it, it's unknown. So unfortunately, my numerator and my denominator are unknowns. Um, let's go ahead and try to fill in any information. Well, we do know that the birth on June 1st, there's a 50% chance that it was a boy and there's a 50% chance that it was a girl. So if we go to the, the B1 variable in that column, all the way to the bottom where it says total, you can fill in a 0 0.5, which indicates 50% chance that the June 1st birth was a boy, 0 0.5 under G1, which indicates 50% chance that the June 1st birth was a girl. Notice that these two values, 0.5 plus 0.5, give you a sum total of one. Okay, probabilities, marginal probabilities should sum to one. Um, all of the probabilities in one particular margin. By the way, that's where the name comes from. Notice in this contingency table, you'll see that these two probabilities exist within this bottom margin. That's why it's called a marginal probability. All right, now that's great. It's called a marginal probability, we know that, but unfortunately, um, what we don't know is we don't know any of the joint probabilities and we don't know any of the probabilities in that second margin. So, what can we do? Well, we're gonna use, of course, Bayes' theorem. That's what this whole video is about. And let's go ahead and just directly apply it. So Bayes' theorem, um, what it does again is it reverses the condition. 
So this numerator is going to be written as the probability of B2 given B1 times the probability of B1. This denominator is going to be the probability of B2 given B1 times the probability of B1. Again, you might recognize that. Um, plus the probability of B2 times B1 complement. Well, B1 complement is just G1 times the probability of G1. Okay, so that is the application of Bayes' theorem. Um, you can pause the video at this point and just go back to the statement of the theorem to just confirm that we plugged everything in appropriately. Um, but right off the bat, you'll notice that we can start filling in some information. Not all of it, but some of it. Right, the probability of B1 is 0 0.5 or 1 half. I'm gonna write it as 1 half. So this is a numerator. Can be written as probability of B2 given B1 times 1 half over the probability of B2 given B1 times 1 half plus the probability of B2 given G1 again times 1 half. <clears throat> okay, the cool thing is in this situation, each and every single term has a 1 half. So we can actually cancel those guys out. And so we can rewrite our probability as the probability of B2 given B1 over the probability of B2 given B1 plus the probability of B2 given G1. Now again, the only reason I'm allowed to get rid of that marginal term um, is that each of these marginals happen to be the same. You cannot do that in general. So that's what kind of makes this problem so genius is that you have a situation where the marginal probabilities actually don't play any role um, because they're all the same and we, we end up canceling them out in some intermediate step. But this is now what our probability boils down to. <clears throat> and let's look at a tree diagram. Initially, we know that there were three boys and N girls. Let's just say that the June 1st baby was a boy. What that would mean is that there are four boys and N girls. Another way to interpret this is we can say that the probability of selecting a boy on June 2nd, given that there was a boy born on June 1st, is equal to the total number of boys over the total number of children in this particular situation. So four over four plus N. If you take a look, that, the, that probability of B2 given B1 is exactly what we have in the numerator and in one part of the denominator. So I'm gonna replace my numerator with four over four plus N. <clears throat> and I'm gonna replace my denominator with four over four plus n, or at least one part of the denominator with that. Now we need to determine the probability of B2 given G1. Well, looking at this tree diagram, we can do the same thing. Initially, we have three boys and n girls. Let's say that a girl was born on June 1st. That would leave us with three boys and n plus one girls. In other words, <clears throat> we can use this information to find the probability of B2 given there was a girl born on June 1st. And so that probability would be the total number of boys, three, over the total number of children, which would be, hey, look at that, n plus one plus three, which is just four plus n again. So of course, we're adding one baby to the population, so the denominators should be the same. Um, so anyway, that second probability in this denominator is 3 over 4 plus n. 
And now here's the really cool thing, what I really thought was awesome about this. So um, let's, let's just combine like terms. Um, the denominators in the denominator are the same, so I could just add those two numerators together. So I have seven over four plus n. And as it turns out, of course, this simplifies to four sevenths. So the incredible thing is, um, th this answer did not even depend on how many girls there were initially. So the fact that we were only told that there were quote unquote, some number of girls, um, might have seemed like a roadblock that was insurmountable. However, it didn't even come into play, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and so anyway, this is your answer, four sevenths. I saw a few students respond to my post and they were both correct. And there you have it. So, so to summarize, if you are trying to solve a conditional probability problem, and it's not really working out when you try to solve it directly, um, try to apply Bayes' theorem. <clears throat> In other words, try to reverse the conditions, because oftentimes if you reverse the conditions, uh, a lot more of the information then becomes available. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned something, and take care everyone, be well.